Hey, how you doing? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, Stock Markets with Bruce. It's Uncle Bruce here. Uh, welcome to Monday morning. This is Monday, June the 14th, uh, 2021. Welcome one, welcome all to this week's uh, the beginning of this week. Uh, cheers to all of you around the world who are joining me and uh, Jennifer here in Creston, BC. We love you. And we thank you for popping in to say hi. We're trying to cover the markets here in plain English. That's that's all I'm about. Uh, trying to cover the stock markets in plain English. What is going on out there in the wild, wild world of investments? A um, couple of things going on. We're hoping for uh, a lot of uh, a lot of new uh, developments this week. We know that uh, tomorrow, I believe it is. Yes, tomorrow is the shareholder vote day for uh, Fortress, F-A-I-I. -I. So F-A-I-I -I tomorrow will have their shareholder meeting to formally approve being taken over by ATI Physical Therapy. We've been waiting for that obviously now for well over 90 days, I think over 120 days. So that's tomorrow officially. Uh, we believe this Thursday, the shares of VGAC will no longer exist and will be now known as 23andMe, M-E will be the symbol for VGAC starting Thursday, I believe. We're looking forward to that. Uh, we have uh, Gore's Holdings and a few other of our SPACs that we like to follow that are going to be calling their shareholder votes at any time. We're, we're really just waiting for them to be told by the SEC that their latest filings are now final. You're good to go. Uh, you've, you've made all the changes that the SEC has wanted done for every single SPAC out there, over 500 of them, and uh, that yours are your, your filings are okay. We've reviewed them and you can now proceed on. This will allow the, the, these other SPACs we're following to call shareholder votes for their own individual transformations and within the next three, four weeks, we start trading under new symbols on all of the SPACs we've been following. These call options on the VGAC and FAII and Gores and others have increased dramatically in price. Um, should we sell within two weeks of expiration or should I just hold until the end of the contract? Well, uh, the strategy that, that I'm hoping will come to play here is that as these uh, SPACs turn into full-blown public companies, as these mergers get done and the name change is done, the hope I have is that the shares will, will run up into this $20 to $30 neighborhood. And a lot of you will, will be really sitting on some super nice profits on your contracts because I've been encouraging you to look at $10 calls and $12.50 calls, $15 calls. So some of you are going to have contracts that are well in the money, $10, $15 in the money plus premium. And uh, this is where uh, your exit strategy will come into play. Um, you'll likely do at least, at the very least, you might do a rollover where you sell contracts at say $15 each that you paid two bucks for, something like that. And you're gonna take that cash and about a quarter of that cash, you're gonna put into a new set of contracts next May, like way into next year, uh, at current prices as a rollover and the three quarters of the cash you have now you're going to put that elsewhere and you're going to continue to diversify your holdings or you're going to acquire shares of the actual stock that you just held options on and you're going to build up your share ownership position because you're going to start to get ready for your next phase of your investment strategy which will be as you build up your portfolio stock positions you're going to become call option writers and you're going to start bringing money in for holding your call. So you've got long-term calls for further upside. You've leveraged, maybe you got 10 calls going forward, 20 calls going forward, 50 calls, depending on what your position is. So you've got a lot of leverage from this point forward long-term for the next, say, three, four months. But in the meantime, you might be looking at writing two-week-long contracts three week long contracts and now taking advantage of the option uh, disintegrations that are happening just ahead of the money of these of these contracts of these shares and you're going to start bringing in income in to your position on each of these SPACs and that's going to make you a very busy hedge fund manager in your own right 
and uh, with the, hopefully uh, the guidance I can give you. Uh, for some of you, you might have enough stock in your portfolio that you can literally live off these premiums that you're bringing in from these, from these options. We'll talk about that going forward. That's another reason why we have these classes coming up. Looking forward to, uh, to doing all of that. When it comes to options, do you always have to execute or can you just sell? You just sell the calls. You'll buy them for $2 a piece, sell them for 6 Buy them for $1.50, sell them for 8 uh, Buy them for 2 sell them for two ten. Um, you know, a, a $2 contract is going to cost you $200. It's 100 shares per contract. So if it's a five fifty contract, it's a $550 contract. If it's a $0.60 cent contract, it's $60. Um, and so there are folks out there who will buy 10 50 cent contracts for $500, 50 bucks each. Um, if the stock has a good enough run and the contracts go to $3, they're selling 10 now at 300 a piece. That's three grand, to turning 500 into $3,000. That's doable. It's not common, but it's doable. Um, a lot of these call contracts that I talk about with regard to these SPACs, uh, I recommend you buy them way out into the future. Um, and so you're paying a premium to get them because you're buying the time, but that's important to have because some of these stocks might move in a week, but they might not move until the fifth week or the eighth week. I don't know. None of us know. So we have to position ourselves now with enough time to make it comfortable for us that even if it's a seven, eight, 10 week process where the shares do make a run, we have contracts that have plenty of time left on them. We're still going to get a very high price on the sell side. We're going to have a nice leveraged play here in our possession. So some of you who have 10 or 20 or 30 call contracts will really do well because every 10 contracts you have, you are, you're leveraging 1,000 shares of stock to the upside. Um, 30, 30 contracts, 3,000 shares of leverage. You get a $5 move on a stock with 3,000 shares of leverage. That's 15,000 gross value of which maybe 10 of it is yours or eight of it is yours, depending on the contract you get. We'll get into that with the classes as well. So yeah, I do uh, I do uh, like it. Uh, you don't exercise them. You just sell them for a big fat profit and uh, whatever you do with the money is up to you. Exactly. There you go. So you say the time value degradation is pretty set in the contract and fluctuates at least in comparison to the stock price or VOL factor. Uh, price value degradation. Uh, you know, if a, if a call has five days left to live, on the Monday morning, it might be worth a dollar twenty if it's out of the money. By the time Thursday rolls around, if it's still way out of the money, it might be down to a quarter, maybe a dime even. And by Friday, it's worth a nickel and then worth nothing. It depends how far out of the money this call is. And uh, that happens with all call contracts that are out of the money. Even the ones that are just, you know, 10 cents out of the money, they, they will become zero at the end of the day, Friday. But um, if you're writing a call contract and you're writing a call that is maybe 10% uh, higher than what the stock is trading at. So if the stock is trading at uh, $20, you're writing a $22 call or your stock is trading at 40, you're writing a $44 call, uh, that contract in the last week and a half will drop dramatically if the stock doesn't get up to that exercise price. And that's what you're looking for as a uh, writer. You're looking for the depreciation of that asset because you get to keep the premium you brought in and it's all yours if it dies worthless, of course. If I write a call contract for six months out, I sell it, that contract gets passed around, bought and sold repeatedly. How do they track it back to me at expiry? It doesn't matter. You don't have to expire it, uh, track it back to you at all. Uh, you might buy back the call you wrote, which isn't the call you wrote. It's the same series. It's like a $1 bill, you see. The bank gives you a brand new $1 bill in America, and you spend that $1 bill, somebody else has it. And then it gets spent on something else, someone else has it. At the end of the week, that bill is in 50 different pockets for all we know. A month from now, that dollar bill is getting worn out, but it's been around all over town. Um, and you get a $1 bill when you go to a 7-Eleven change, and there's a $1 bill. You got the dollar bill that you had before, but it's not the same dollar bill. It's a dollar bill. Same thing with these contracts. You write the contract, and you've got it out. It's gone out there. You got the money for it. Uh, it, it expires in a couple of days after a little while. It, it's getting ready for expiry. 
you buy the call back for super cheap money. You don't buy back your own call. You buy back whatever call you can get at the on the market. You're just putting an order in for that version of the of the call. You get it, and you are no longer obligated to issue stock to anybody anymore because you're out, you're out from underneath your obligation. You bought the you bought a call back that you had sold. Uh, and it's like getting a one dollar bill a month later. That's a different serial number. Doesn't matter. It's worth a buck. And there you have it. So now you're out from under, and and whoever's got your call, you know, it's out there somewhere. Someone else might get notified that they're being exercised, or the calls die worthless because they're out of the money. And they just die worthless, and uh, no one gets called on anything. So there's that. You got a question a while ago about buying long calls that are basically in the money. And they give you control of two to three times the shares than you could otherwise directly buy. Yeah, is this a good risk averse strategy? Yeah. So uh, the example, uh, one of the examples could be on SoFi. Um, the stock's like twenty-two something dollars a share. Okay, you can buy one hundred shares of SoFi for about twenty-two hundred dollars, and if the stock goes to thirty bucks, you're up eight hundred dollars. 100 shares, eight bucks a share, great. But with $2,200, you could acquire January contracts way out there that are in the money. You need to buy, for example, you could buy three $7 contracts on SoFi. Now, my guess is that those would get you probably three uh, 1750s would be my hunch. Those stocks are approximately, uh, what is it, 350 in the money. And um, you might, I'm not sure if you can get 15s. Uh, there's a possibility you could get 15s, actually. I, I, well, there's seven in the money. No, you won't get that. You'll get 1750s. So at $22, you'll get 17, you'll be 450 in the money. There you go. Uh, but you can get three of them. So for $2,200, you can get three contracts that are in the money right now on SoFi, and they're good until January. All right. Ah, same example. Stock goes to 30. All right. Uh, those three contracts will be $1,250 in the money each, plus premium. If the shares reach $30 in a month from now, they'd still have seven months of time left or six months of time left. They would probably sell for, let's see, at 30, they would be 750 in the money. They'll probably sell about 950. <clears throat> so they might even go for 10. So you'd be in the $10, you have a $10 uh, scenario. No, I take it back. I'm completely wrong. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of something else. If the stock goes to 30, the 1750 contracts that you bought, all three of them, each one would be twelve fifty in the money plus a buck fifty premium. They'd be trading at fourteen dollars each. You'd have three of them, fourteen hundred times three. You'd have forty two hundred dollars in in contracts versus three thousand dollars in stock because you had a hundred shares versus at thirty versus three contracts at seventeen fifty. Then are now worth forty two hundred. So you're twelve hundred dollars richer than you would be, right? So you took. 2200 turned it into three grand by buying the stock or you took 2200 and turned it into forty two hundred dollars buying the contracts because you have three contracts 300 shares of leverage for the same amount of money all the way out to january that's the mentality of a contract buyer in that area okay now if you can afford to buy a thousand shares of sofi for twenty two thousand dollars right now or afford to buy 30 contracts of SoFi right now for $22,000. Uh, you have 3,000 shares of leverage, right? So you'd have 30 $1,400 contracts at the end of it. So that would be $42,000 of contracts for $22,000 purchase. You see the leverage? 30 grand versus 42 grand if you had the stock, right? 1,000 shares, you'd be worth 30,000. 30 contracts, you're worth 42000 in this case. That's what I meant by this comment right here. That's kind of what I'm talking about. Um, it's not a bad strategy if you, uh, if you buy contracts long enough. It's not a bad strategy. All right, there you go. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for that. If you'd like to talk to me about a one-hour session, you want to get together with me, send me an email. 
through uh, my email address, which is right here. It's the old school hotmail.com email address. Send me an email. Say, Bruce, I'd like to talk to you on a one-on-one -on -one session. When can you book me in? I'd like to, uh, I'd like to make a reservation and, and, and lock it in right away.